Well, hi there, and welcome to our Bible study on the Lighthouse Discord server on 1 Corinthians. Before we begin, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Father, it's an honor and a blessing to come before you in prayer, to share your word with others, and to hear what they have to say about your word. Father, today we have many needs represented on the server, and one of the people in our study today, who I will not name, Lord, is going to be undergoing a very serious surgery next week. God, I pray for this individual. I ask, Lord, that you would lead and guide the surgeon's hands, that you would lead and guide the anesthesiologist and the nurses and all those involved in this individual's care. Any time, Lord, that there is work to be done on the spine, it's risky, it's terrifying, but Lord, we need your intervention and we need your healing because the outcome needs to be excellent. We do not want to see issues, Lord, for our friend. And so, God, I pray that you would place your hand of healing upon him because your word says in Isaiah 53 that by his stripes, meaning Jesus' stripes, we are healed. And I pray this for our friend. God, I ask, too, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive the words that you have for us today. I pray, Lord God, that whatever goes on in our study today, whatever goes on in the server tonight, Lord, that everything would be done as a fragrant offering of blessing to you, that you would be blessed by all we say and do. Be with us in our study today and help us to learn what you want for us. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen. So we have talked quite a bit over the last couple of days, actually, about salvation, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So today, we're actually picking up at 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 29, and reading from the New King James. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence that's a lot of words and It seems as if Paul was quite enamored with the fact that God chose him. And quite honestly, he should be. If you had been part of the earlier studies that we've done on the survey, you would understand that Paul was formerly called Saul. Paul was essentially almost like a hitman against Christians. And God did something dramatic with him on the road to Damascus, and he lost his sight. And he was re- his vision was restored. But Paul was converted to become one of the strongest Christians that we would ever read about in scripture. And he was significantly flawed. But in spite of the fact that he was a flawed human being, Paul reconciled himself to the fact that there was nothing 
he could do to save himself. He readily admitted to his beloved church in Ephesus, which is the book of Ephesians, in words that apply equally to every true follower of Jesus, including us. And this is Ephesians 1, 3 to 6 message, but I'm also going to read it in the NASB. But the message says, how blessed is God? And what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Like I said, that's the message and the message is not a actual translation of scripture. It's a paraphrase. It's like somebody read scripture and then wrote it again, kind of in their own words. It's a little better quality than that, but just so that you understand. So now I'm going to read in the NASB. But this time I will start at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. And I'm going to just add these few verses. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, on which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. That takes us almost to the end of verse 10. And I, I like to read in context sometimes. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful words. So, God the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Which begs the question, just what kind of people does God choose? Now, before we get into this, and I'm sorry, I do have a cough that hits me. I want to talk about predestination because that's one of the terms that comes up when we read this passage there are some denominations that believe that god predestines us which means some will receive christ and others who are not chosen won't i am not personally of that camp I believe, as John 3, 16 and 17 talks about, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's verse 16. I personally believe that anyone who chooses to believe in Christ will be saved. But if you believe opposite of that, and you do believe in predestination, I'm not here to argue with you on it. I simply wanted to mention that. But 
what kind of people does God choose? Because what we're talking about here is characteristics of the cult. And here's Paul's answer. And it really is rather encouraging. The base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring nothing, the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That is, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. By the way, that's 1 Corinthians 1, verses 28 to 31 in the New King James. You see, and this is something, friends, that, you know, we were having a little bit of a discussion on the server tonight. And I think this is really important. And I want to make this abundantly clear. The fact is that there are no superstars in Christ's kingdom. Now, it may look that way, but the reality is there isn't. You and I do not have to be somebody in the eyes of the world in order to be somebody to God. He delights in choosing people whom the world considers nobodies. Do you know that? Because in choosing us nobodies, he exposes the hollow pretensions of the somebodies according to 1 Corinthians 129 message, who spend their lives desperately trying to be somebody in the eyes of anybody. The reality is that anybody except the one whose eyes really matter. Now, C.S. Lewis wrote, no good work is done anywhere without aid from the Father of Lights. So no matter how good a preacher a person may be, and there are some that are amazing. We've all probably seen Billy Graham, for example. We all, or some of us, may have heard of Josh McDowell, Warren Wearsby, more modern David Platt, I think, or Pratt, Francis Chen. I mean, there's hundreds of pastors online who preach. But the reality is, no good work is done without aid from the Father of Lights. They couldn't do their jobs. I can't do mine. You can't do yours without God the Father. Then in 1 Corinthians 1, 30 to 31. But of him you were in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You see, there's one thing about Paul that's interesting. He never lost the wonder of it all. Do you know how many times I hear online how you know, and I often get DMs about how people are so discouraged in their faith. You know, they believe and then something happens and they've lost their encouragement. Let me tell you something. This is just me speaking to you personally. If anybody has difficulties in life right now, it would be my husband and me. His health is dreadful. I honestly cannot tell you how much longer I will have him. It could be any day that the Lord takes him home. Why? Because he's got that many health challenges. But you know what? I still glory in the Lord. And Paul, all throughout his whole ministry, every book that he wrote, he gloried in the Lord. He never lost the wonder of his faith, even when he was put in jail for his faith and was facing death. You see, the wonder of how God could love him, save him, and use him as he did. And Paul saw in himself and in the Christians of Corinth, and you have to understand that the church in Corinth was a mess. We talked about this early on. 
but the wisdom of the God who planned his salvation, the righteousness of the God who made him righteous, the sanctification of the God who began that sanctifying process, whereby Paul was being daily transformed into the likeness of Christ, and the redemption of the God who saw in Paul a soul worth redeeming. Okay, big words. What is sanctification? It's essentially, in my understanding and teaching, being made holy. It's something that occurs after we've been a Christian for a little while. And it's not something that's just a one-time event, but it's something that happens and then it's like a continual growth. Now I know that there are different versions of what sanctification means. In the typical Pentecostal church, it would mean baptism in the Holy Spirit and you have to speak in tongues. Well, I don't believe that, but there are some who do. And I'm not saying that speaking in tongues is wrong and we're not going to go down that rabbit trail right now, but I'm just saying that that is essentially what sanctification is or the sanctifying process of being made holy. And that is something that Paul went through. Now, did Paul deserve to go through that? Did Paul deserve to be redeemed? He was a murderer of Christians. Yet God saw fit to not only redeem Paul and cause him to turn to Christ, but he made him one of the greatest evangelists of all time. So what a way to end the first chapter of this great letter with this reminder from 1 Corinthians 1, 30 to 31 in the NLT. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be the embodiment of wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He has made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. You see, when we make Jesus our focus, let the boasting begin. When we make it all, by our, all about ourselves, we might be want to be really, really careful. So there's a chapter wrap up that I'm going to run through. Both the Corinthians and the Athenians loved philosophy more than they loved God. And Paul addressed this by admitting that the message of the cross truly is foolishness to those who love themselves more than God. But he also made it clear that these two groups of people actually consist of those who are saved and those who are perishing. And it should be obvious which is which. You see, friends, here's the thing. There's those of us who are saved. And there's those of us who are perishing. But in the saving, note that that means an ongoing relationship with Christ. And I think we need to remember that. So we could look at two major classifications of religion in the world. There's those that offer self-service and those that offer full service salvation. And Christianity is the only one that offers full service salvation. Now, Jesus himself was not recognized as the Jewish Messiah because he failed to fulfill one of the Jews' main expectations. He did not free them from Roman oppression. The Jews at that time thought that Jesus would come with multitudes of military, copious amounts of money, weaponry, etc., and would take their land back from Roman oppression. <clears throat> and lastly, whether God chose us for salvation or whether we chose him instead. Like I said, you know, depending on what your position is on the term predestination, 
it's really a question that's too big and too broad for this discussion. But what matters is that we are among his chosen ones. We are among those who believe. But God has arranged for us to be in that wonderful position. So there's a few questions that I think are not a bad thing for us to have a look at. And the first would be, in what ways was the Athens of Paul's time a true sister city to Corinth? And I think that that is not a bad question to ask. So I'm just going to try to find or get to the answers here that they um, had talked about. So its citizens worship the same false gods. They pursued the same perverted pleasures and they thought about the same philosophical thoughts about higher things. So here's a tough question. And I, I'm just asking you to think about these as I give these answers. Why does the message of the cross appear to be foolishness to so many people? And the answer, and I do agree with this, is because it requires them to trust in God rather than in themselves. And most people are simply not willing to do that. Hello? I think, yeah, that's very much the case. Then, do you believe using the self-serve and full-service designations as a helpful way to differentiate between other religions and Christianity? Why or why not? And this is something that only you or I can answer. It's not something that, you know, anybody else can answer for us. But, you know, it's like that conversation we had today about gender identity. You know, are we choosing to identify ourselves the way God made us? Or are we wanting it to be our way? And the last one. Again, so only something we can answer on our own is why do we or why do we not believe that God literally chose us for salvation? You see, I can't justify that he chose us for salvation because that means then that he's leaving some behind. And that's not the merciful God that I understand. It's also not the teaching that I understand. Although, when I first accepted Christ, that was the teaching that I had heard. But I personally don't believe that. So I'm going to end with prayer. And then we can discuss this in our, on the server. Father, <clears throat> whether we believe that you chose us before the foundation of the world, to serve you and whether you chose not or did not choose some others is a debate that we could go on about for hours. And I'm not here to debate that theology, Lord. I'm here to bring the teaching that you have provided in your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you have called all of us to something greater than ourselves. You have called all of us to be your servants. Use us in whatever capacity you can and will and prepare us for the journey, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in your holy name. Amen.